Is this okay, ma'am? Yes, yes, okay. Good evening, all. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 282, the 23rd in the UVR session. We have today with us the very knowledgeable yet humble Dr. Dipankar Das sir, from Sri Shankar Deva Netralaya, Goa Hati, to speak to us on parasitic uveitis. May I now request Dr. Abhilasha, ma'am, to please introduce the speaker for today. Thank you, Subhav. Uh, it's my proud privilege to introduce Dr. Deepankar Das, who is one of the stalwarts of uveitis in India. Uh, he did his residency and fellowship in general ophthalmology from Guwahati Medical College, Assam. He did a fellowship in ocular pathology and uveitis under Dr. Jyotirmay Biswas at the prestigious Shankar Nitrale Chinni. Uh, he did an observership in inflammation, uveitis, and ophthalmic pathology with Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Narsing Rao at Dohini Eye Institute, University of South California. He is currently a senior consultant, uh, ocular pathology, uveitis, and neuroophthalmology at Sri Shankar Dev Netrale, Guwahati, Assam. He has more than 168 peer reviewed publications and over 271 national and international presentations. He has described a new rosette in uh, retinoblastoma, and he is the recipient of the first KR Datta Award on his paper entitled CMB Retinitis, First Case Report in Northeast India, Best Scientific Poster by Uveitis Society of India for his poster, Parasitic Uveitis. And uh, Parasitic Uveitis is the topic that he'll be talking on today, and we eagerly look forward to hear to you, sir. Over to you, Dr. Dipankar Das, sir. My slides are visible, Abhilesha? Not mm -hmm. yet, sir. So till sir is sharing the screen, I would just like to remind all of you. Um, so I focus offline is where we all will be meeting soon. And uh, to the ones who are still interested, we actually have one or two slot cancellations. So if you are still interested and you're not able to log in, you can contact me and I can do uh, make, it, make it easy for you. Over to you, Dipanka, sir. So yeah. we can see the slides now. Okay. Thank you, Abhilasha, for this uh, generous introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, iFocus team, uh, Dr. Shantosh Hanover, Dr. Uh, uh, Rolika, Shubha, uh, uh, then all other at uh, CFS for giving me this opportunity to present parasitic uveitis. I'll be presenting parasitic uveitis from Indian context, uh, particularly in Northeast India. Uh, some of the parasitic uveitis that we see in a broad different part of Africa, uh, South America, I will not be discussing this. So basically, uh, slide is not. The slides are not moving forward, so maybe you can click on the screen once and it will go. Yeah. Yeah. So I do not have any financial or commercial interest in any of this material discussed in this presentation. This is purely an academic one. Well, if you see what is a parasite from our undergraduate microbiology or parasitology textbook, we know any living organism which receives nourishment and shelter from another organism where it lives are called parasites. Now, these parasites can be unicellular like protozoa or multicellular like various trematodes, nematodes, etc. Now, the parasites can be ectoparasites, endoparasites, they can be a temporary parasite or permanent parasite. Some parasites are facultative or obligatory, some are occasional, and some are wandering parasites. Now, in protozoology, uh, we know the amoeba. Uh, giardia, uh, then leishmaniasis, toxoplasmosis, sometimes pneumosis testis can cause uh, uh, parasitic uh, evitis or eye in, in infections. In helminthology, we know cystoid, particularly the uh, tapeworm, crematodes, nematodes, etc., can cause this 
uh, you view this. Now, in ocular parasitology, toxoplasmosis uh, is out of this uh, uh, topic here because a few days back, uh, Dr. from Brazil presented toxoplasmosis. Now, uh, I'll be skipping toxoplasmosis in this presentation. Cysticercosis, toxocariasis, oncocerciasis. Oncocerciasis, again, prevalent in Africa and part of the South America. So I will be just touching those tick primary infection, as you see. Uh, so in uh, Dr. Ratinam's presentation a uh, um, uh, few days back, and diffuse unital subacute neuronitis, which was earlier called Weeper syndrome, uh, will be discussed with a case example. Filariasis, Lua Lua, and Dirophilidia uh, um, is seen, uh, Dirophilidia is seen uh, in our scenario. Escariasis, uh, I have not seen, but these are in the literature. Trypanosomiasis, which is being now almost whipped out from the African and American trypanosomiasis, which is American trypanosomiasis known as Chagas disease. Nethostomiasis, we have seen a couple of live parasites uh, in our scenario and has been reported from India. Cystosomiasis, again, a parasitic disease that is seen, uh, particularly bilargiasis, which affects the uh, renal system and other uh, hydatidsis, basically for the orbital structure and other lip has been seen. Seasonal hyperacute panubiotis, which is seen in Nepal, um, reported by Mala and Upadhyay et al., um, is a regional uh, uveitis that has been seen. Malaria infection, as reported by uh, Professor Biswas uh, from Chennai and few other uh, authors, particularly involving the retina, having a retinopathy and uh, retinal hemorrhages. Amoebiasis, GRDSs, and ophthalmomyosis externa and interna are some of the disease as such. So parasitic genotic disease are prevalent globally as well as India and in our population in Northeast India. Proper epidemiological data are lacking from different parts of the country on genotic parasitic diseases and newer diseases are emerging in our scenario. These are the two publications from our center uh, uh, of uh, parasitic UVATs. Now, this will be a basically a case-based discussion with some video documentation. Now, this is a rare case of anterior chamber dirofideriasis, which was seen a uh, few years back. Um, patient presented with, uh, he was 60 years old man, presented with irritation and some cr uh, insect crawling inside the eye, in the right eye. Uh, and uh, then the patient came to the OPD with this uh, uh, you can see that the worm was dancing in the, in the anterior chamber. Now, I immediately uh, called our uh, surgeon, uh, Dr. Kalyan Das, who uh, uh, had taken the patient to the OT and immediately uh, by parasynthesis, he has, uh, dis, uh, uh, he has um, removed the worm by um, uh, methyl cellulose delivery. Delivery. Now, this worm was uh, put in a normal saline and sent to the uh, laboratory for investigation. And here, you know, what we did is that uh, 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 took the worm in the petri dish and uh, by uh, uh, examining the direct uh, live uh, worm, which has been seen in the monitor of uh, the uh, um, uh, computer uh, directly. And you, you can well appreciate all internal structure that we see in the wet mount preparation are seen directly. This we have uh, uh, published and discussed with the veterinary parasitology where they found it very wonderful when I presented this paper in National uh, Parasitology Meet. You can well appreciate that all internal structure that you see after three or four days of processing, you can see immediately and report to the surgeon that you are dealing with such worm if you are acquainted with the parasitology uh, diagnosis. Now you see this uh, head portion, the esophagus and the mouth portion, everything like uh, what you see in the, uh, what you called uh, in the wet mount preparation, this can be seen. 
Uh, these are the wetment preparation, and this is the histopathology of the one of dirofidia, which we can uh, diagnose uh, in this scenario. And this is the post-operative patient improved uh, with 6-6 six -six vision in this case. Now, this is again one of our publications showing a large dilophoria worm causing a CNVM in these cases. Now, uh, uh, the photocoagulation was done in this uh, worm, and such worm in the posterior seg segment can be involved in some cases. So basically, if you see this sort of one clinical history, starting from uh, the um, travel history, then uh, food history, then hygiene history, all are very, very important because these give clue that what is there. For example, history of pets, such as dog can give rise to toxocariasis, cat can be for toxoplasmosis. External examination includes skin for visceral larva migrants or mucosal larva migrants uh, can be uh, seen in the skin. For example, various rashes can be seen and you can correlate with your finding. Seat lamp examination include application tonometry because there may be sometimes hypertensive evities or glaucoma uh, following a one infestation. Then gonioscopy to see the angle structure, if you can visualize uh, um, through cornea. Fundus examination, such as slit lamp biomicroscopy using 90 diopter lens and indirect ophthalmoscopy with uh, scleral depression with plus 20 uh, diopter lens is very, very important. Ultrasound B scan, uh, uh, scan um, is very, very important for cysticercosis and other one when even when there is a panophthalmitis like picture and you cannot visualize the fundus. Fundus frozen angiography, FFA and OCT and electrophysiology for uh, diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis can be optional, but this gives a clue. Serological tests such as ELISA um, is important, CT, MRI, and direct live examination of parasite under microscope, scanning electron microscope and energy dispersive spectroscopy can tell you about the elemental composition of spine, et cetera, in these cases. Eosinophil count, absolute eosinophil count can indirectly tell the parasitic infestation and stool examiner sometimes for um, GRDR, sometimes for uh, escariasis, amoeba can be helpful in these situations. Now, uh, if you see uh, this, uh, uh, this is a uh, methodology that I've told you. When you see the live worm, you uh, see in the lab and direct visualization will give. Now, additional uh, investigation that use of fluorescein to demarcate this, all this uh, external structure is also very, very important in these cases. And obviously, this, uh, this we have pub uh, published in uh, the textbook of um, parasitology, uh, where uh, the direct examination has been recognized uh, by the uh, um, author. Scanning electron microscopy EDX is important for the uh, diagnosis of some of the parasites that we have seen. Now, this is very, very interesting case uh, seen in 2007, and we have published it in intravitreal nephrostomiasis. Uh, Professor uh, Harsha Bhattacharya sir has diagnosed this case, and this patient, uh, she, uh, the, the patient was a uh, 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 basically a nurse by profession and was ha having habit of taking smoke fish, that is a local delicacy. Now, this patient was brought to uh, uh, patient, uh, uh, OPD and there was a worm sitting there. And this is an animation how the three port parts vitrectomy was done uh, and uh, removal of vitreous hemorrhage and along with fruit needles where the worm was picked up and brought out. Now we see the video of pars planar vitrectomy, uh, three-port pars planar vitrectomy, which was done. And this is this was done by uh, Professor Harsha Bhattacharya in 2007. And you see this is uh, how the vitrectomy was done to the core vitrectomy is being carried out to remove the all the vitreous hemorrhages. And no, uh, these were uh, very meticulously uh, done to remove the hemorrhages. 
And this is this was the worm that was visualized, and you can well appreciate the worm was uh, encapsulated within a pseudo capsule. This was the hemorrhages being uh, uh, cleared. And you see the live worm was dancing and it is probably frightened by the uh, operative maneuver. And no, it is making a U-turn. Now it is going in, making a retinotomy and piercing the retina and going inside because it's frightened. Now here the surgeon found it very challenging to retrieve the worm at this position. Because this, is, this video was in real time, which is every procedure was very fast. See, the surgeon is dissecting the pseudocapsule and he is trying to pull the uh, worm going in. Now with a flute needle, now you see the worm will just picked up, just picked up and brought out and it was still live at this point of time. Now this is the post-operative picture where all the hemorrhage, et cetera, are gone and patient uh, vision was improved six, six, and six. This was a wet mount preparation. And you see the full, uh, mouth and having a four transverse hooklet and the body and the uh, caudal and having this uh, uh, changes. Professor Narsing Rao uh, did uh, um, help us to uh, take a scanning electron microscopy of this one. And this was the uh, different uh, head, um, uh, body, and the tail portion of the one. Now you see this one I've shown you in the retina causing a retinal hole. Again, another nethostoma spinagerium causing an iris hole. And this one was again brought live. And you see the, the methodology of what we, uh, what we use. And here you observe the head end of the nethostoma spinagerium in the computer monitor uh, when it was taken um, uh, from the uh, Petri dish when the one was put there. And you see this head end, all these are four hooklets that can be seen and that can immediately diagnose. Within three minutes or four minutes, it was diagnosed that we are dealing with nethostoma spinagerium. And these are the wet mount preparation. And this we published in uh, the, uh, peer reviewed journal. So nethostoma, if you see, this is a rare intraocular parasite. And if the life cycle of parasites are very, very important because this is a uh, infestation that is caused by L3 of the parasitic uh, uh, stage of the larva. And most of the nethostoma are uh, surgically retrieved. Migration of um, causing iris and retinal hole are seen. No known medication was uh, known to work in these cases. Again, another case of a worm that is basically in the, uh, uh, just below the uh, lead uh, in the uh, temporal upper um, areas. And it was, and also causing evades in this case, probably some heat, um, uh, uh, hypersensitive reaction happened in evades. And this one was diagnosed as a, the uh, worm called Thalesia. 
Now, these are the different white mount preparation of the thalasia and the compound my, uh, scanning electron microscope show the thalasia squam. Now, these are the sometimes thalasia, uh, live thal thalasia calipedia uh, was seen uh, with a gravid uterus that we have published and also thalasia calipedia by Lam, by uh, Dr. Jayanta Das uh, and our team published this in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. These are the different uh, head and uh, uh, striation that are seen in the uh, thalasia. Now, cystisarcosis is very, very important. This is uh, in the left eye, there was a uh, dimness of vision in the patient and there's a floaters uh, complaint. There's a vitreous cells and this on um, Montage uh, fundus photography, there's a lesion, translucent lesion and light uh, uh, collex was seen here in this case. And when B scan ultrasound was done, there's a cyst and the scolex was seen in the uh, here and uh, uh, on uh, dissecting out the scolex and cyst was seen in this. So sometimes you get invaginated form of cysticarcosis. This usually we all knew before that these, uh, these those are seen in the orbit or lid structure. But recently we have seen this case in intraocular structure also. Now here, this is another form of cysticarcosis, which is called racemic form of cysticarcosis, which is seen in CNS involvement. And this we, uh, few years back, we published in neuro and intraocular cysticarcosis with clinical pathological case report. This patient presented with uh, around 19 years girl, presented with white pupillary reflex, uh, so immediately we have seen the fundus and there was a uh, large uh, retinochoroidal lesion with some satellite lesion and there's a neovascularization. Now in this situation, a lot of evitis differential diagnosis comes to your mind, but when B scan ultrasound was done, uh, it was clear that you are dealing with cystisarcosis. There's a definite uh, cyst we had seen uh, and the patient who had uh, epilepsy, so immediately we have done MRI scan. MRI showed multi pull a coin shaped lesion of neurocystic sarcosis. Now this uh, gross specimen, cut section of the eyeball is very, very important to understand a, uh, pathogenesis of cystic sarcosis. Means if you see a cystic sarcosis live in the eye and if put albendazole or prasicontol directly, this is going to kill the worm and incite a severe reaction like this endophthalmitis. Okay, so it is advisable that you remove the one live in this patient, then you put uh, albendazole and steroid in those situation. So this is very, very important uh, specimen that uh, probably it was given um, uh, anti-helminthic medication and leading to this uh, endophthalmitis like picture with retinal detachment and the subretinal cysticercus lesion here. Now, sometimes cysticercus can affect lead. The oculoplastic surgeon and uh, consultant can get these sort of cases where uh, muscle restriction can be there, and this is also can be seen. This we published just uh, uh, one or uh, weeks back when intraocular and neurocysticercosis with stromal choroiditis was seen in the patient. Uh, the, um, this invaginated form uh, probably we have seen uh, for the first time in the intraocular structures. So cysticercosis, if you see the life cycle, definite host is a peak for tinea solium and tinea sagenta, basically the cow uh, and accidental intermediate host is the man. Translucent cyst with movement that we can pick up with in subretinal space, vitreous or anterior chamber. Other area of cysticercus location can be in conjunctiva extraocular muscle that I've shown you, as eyelid or orbit. Blurry vision, floaters, epilepsy, uh, and uveitis or endophthalmitis can be there. And sometimes panophthalmitis and uh, endophthalmitis may be there due to rupture of the cyst. B scan, ultrasound, CT, MRI and sometimes antibody for ELISA can be seen uh, for systemic cystic sarcosis and stool examination, uh, sometimes important. Removal of cysts from the uh, anterior chamber by, and um, by pars planar vitectomy uh, is the uh, treatment of choice. anti helminthic and steroids uh, are important uh, after removal of the cyst. 
preventive medicine, for example, uh, uh, cooking of the food, um, particularly uh, avoid dense of uh, um, uncooked uh, meat, then washing of the vegetable, washing of the hands, you know, proper sanitation, etc., are very, very important for this preventive medicine. Now, next we are uh, in, interested for toxocariasis, which can have a peripheral uh, toxocaral lesion, uh, or it can have a central uh, posterior pole lesion, or can uh, present with chronic endophthalmitis. Important thing is that this patient have a history of, uh, children have a history of uh, pica, that is eating, uh, eating of marts, etc. from the sea. And here, uh, history of contact with pups, the puppies are very, very important. And um, so they are the differential diagnosis of a um, white pupillary reflex, particularly retinoblastoma. For the students to remember, T for toxocara, T for traction. Traction you see in uh, toxocariasis, unlike retinoblastoma in these cases. Now, this patient, uh, after steroid, uh, there's inflammation was reduced. So, toxocara canis or catis uh, can spread from food, uh, soil contaminated by uh, infected animal. Unilateral strabismus or leukocoria is usually presenting symptoms, can have ocular or systemic uh, visceral larva migraines, peripheral granuloma, posterior pulled granuloma, or chronic endophthalmitis are the presenting features. This can ultrasound can um, be done for the diagnosis and CT brain for uh, neurotoxocariasis can be one manifestation. I've seen uh, one or two cases in my uh, practice for 20 years. Steroids and vitrectomy, vitrectomy particularly for traction, ERM and retinal detachment can be done. Now let us move to something called diffuse inertial subacute neuroretinitis. This is case one is a 40 year old male uh, from East India with complaint of dimness of vision um, for near three to four months and photophobia in right eye for two months. Recently came from Saudi Arabia and previous skin allergy presently asymptomatic. He had a feeling of some insect crawling in legs and feet. Complete blood count revealed uh, elevated eosinophil level and absolute eosinophil level. On examination, vision uh, in the right eye was 636 partial and NH, uh, and left eye, it was normal. There was a, re a relative efferent pupillary defect on the right eye. Anterior chamber, both eye was quite vitreous. Uh, uh, inflammation was seen plus two in the right eye and uh, haze was there. The left eye was normal. Fundless examination revealed uh, some sort of uh, uh, retinocortical lesion with hemorrhage and uh, um, some sort of uh, uh, vas vasculitis like pattern. There was a disc edema was seen with uh, peripapillary hemorrhages. And uh, we had, uh, this is the posterior pole photograph of this patient. Then the flows and angiography showed uh, uh, activity in the lesion with both healed and active lesions. We have done a, a ICG also in this patient to see a deeper involvement. We showed uh, uh, in the superior temporal portion, uh, portion there was an involvement was seen. OCT was important. There was a retinal thinning in the right eye, uh, particularly when compared with outer retinal layer and inner retinal layer. Left eye was normal uh, in this case, and field showed uh, defect consistent with the uh, 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 lesion in the fundus. ERG showed uh, subnormality in the um, right eye and patient was given oral steroid and oral albendazole in this patient. Now, second case is very, very interesting. 33 year old female presented with photophobia in the right eye for two weeks. In flows and angiography, there's early block flows and, and late staining. ERG and EOG was subnormal in this case. And you can see uh, there was a uh, small worm in the uh, right eye, which was uh, photocoagulation was done uh, and left eye was normal. So direct photocoagulation of the worm and steroid was given in this patient. So Professor Donald Gus in 1977 first addressed the Royal Society of Medicine uh, about 
the uh, unilateral Wieper syndrome later on called diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis. Now, this is uh, uh, basically uh, caused by one or more type of motile or subretinal nematodes uh, and can have an early or late manifestation. These are the areas where DUS has been reported from America, South America, Europe, uh, uh, some cases from uh, India uh, have DUS and report. Now you see several species was uh, known, for example, um, Ascaris canis, Strongylus tarcoris, Ascaris lumbricoids, and uh, B. prosinus has been known to cause this sort of worm. Now, basically, uh, the formation of granuloma in enucleated case uh, was reported by uh, Donald Gass. You know, why uh, size of the worm is important? Um, because some of the worm causes a crack and the toxic inflammatory response and autoimmune reaction sometimes affect retinochoroidal and adjoining structures. Now, um, there may be a period of activity and remission because of the worm, less commonly may have pain, photophobia, and redness, decreased visual acuity, and central and parascatal scotoma can be seen. Now, you see the early phase, there may be crisis, optic disc edema, as shown in our first case, recurrent crops of evanescent multifocal white yellowish lesion at the level of outer retina. RP choroid clustered in only one region of the retina. Less frequently, there may be iridocyclitis, perimeras ex exudation, subretinal hemorrhage. And in late cases, mostly in the chronic phases, severe vision loss, diffuse depigmentation of RP, optic nerve atrophy, retinal and, uh, uh, arterial narrowing, uh, increased retinal, in, uh, retinal, inner retinal membrane reflex. That reflex is very, very important for DUSN. And recurrent crops of multifocal white yellowish lesion um, can be seen. Presence of tunnel and crack can be seen in chronic cases. Now you see early cases can be uh, differential diagnosis, can be multifocal choroiditis or acute posterior placoid um, uh, pigment epithelopathy or multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. Barshot retinochoroiditis is not seen in our country. Sometimes simulates, can simulate sympathetic ophthalmia or syphilis. Late st stages can be a post Traumatic chorioretinopathy can simulate retinitis pigmentosa, occl occlusive vascular disease, sarcoidosis, syphilis, and toxic uh, retinopathy. Sitlam biomicroscopy, eosinophilia, frozen angiography, ICG, as in the first case, electroretinogram or Goldman perimetry is useful. Now, when mm, a live one is found, laser treatment to kill the nematodes is useful. Successful treatment can uh, improve the visual acuity and reduce uh, the ocular inflammatory signs. Oral treat, mm, uh, treatment include oral steroid, albendazole, uh, when the one uh, is not found. Prognosis depends uh, if good, uh, if larva is visualized in early stage, poor if diagnosis is delayed. So uh, uh, to comment about this, there may be variable sizes of worm detected and reported with longer arm, which form the crack. Ancillary multimodal imaging and electrophysiological tests are helpful. Laboratory diagnosis should include eosinophil count uh, for nematode infection. Uh, management of DSN depends on the worm visibility or not. Systemic treatment with antihelminthic and oral steroid are given in patient and confirmed cases. Now, sometimes we get echinococcus because echinococcus uh, or hydrated disease mostly is seen in the orbit or lead structure. Now we see this is the echinococcus which we stain with our innovative frozen stain. And uh, this is the echinococcus uh, in frozen stain which got published in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Hydrated disease, hydrated disease Mm, uh, the the, the uh, cyst can be seen in the orbit. Uh, now, this cyst, if you take a photograph, this cyst has a multi-loculated uh, layers, and because this uh, helped in the passage of the sol solutes that we have uh, documented and found for the first time. So, echinococcus and hydrated disease is an infection caused by large uh, stage, uh, larval stage of echinococcus species, and is a significant public health problem for India and other countries. In India, there is an alarming increase of this infection, mostly in North India. The presence of stray dogs and fallen carcasses plays an important role in transmission of the disease in our country. 
Now, toxoplasmosis, already Dr. Daniel has uh, spoken widely, but toxoplasmosis is the commonest cause of uh, um, parasitic posterior uveitis uh, in India and abroad. Uh, so this basically has a uh, congenital toxoplasmosis or acquired toxoplasmosis. Most of them have retinochoroiditis or over more than 89% of the cases in the uh, in different uh, publication or pattern of uveitis. Now this toxoplasmosis uh, uh, can have a, a macular uh, toxoplasmosis uh, in uh, congenital toxoplasmosis uh, and uh, in acquired uh, toxoplasmosis, they are usually present with a light in fog uh, appearance uh, or sometimes in HIV patients, the lesion seems to be larger uh, also and multifocal uh, involvement. Oncosarcias is, is a uh, reward brightness which is very, very important for sub-Saharan area, which is a skin manifestation. Skin manifestation, which starts from rashes, simple rashes to deeper lesion, where there may be uh, dryness of skin, which is called a, a leopard skin or a lizard skin. Sometimes they can have a, a deeper lesion with a uh, oncosarcoma, which is a granulomatous lesion. Uh, they have, can have um, uh, what we call corneal infiltrates, corneal opacity. They can have uh, cataract. They can have uh, uveitis with anterior uveitis. Uh, the worm uh, parasites can be seen. Microphyllidia can be seen in the um, anterior chamber in the slit lamp. You ask the patient in Africa. They are the ophthalmologist. Ask the patient to put their head down, then they put the, then they see the sleep lamp, microphyllidia is visible. Uh, they, they can have a pain uveitis. They can have a different spectrum with chorea retinitis, chorea retinal atrophy, or uh, optic neuropathy. Sometimes remote uh, uh, systemic manifestation of neuro-oncosarcosis may be there. And uh, there are a lot of prevention uh, method uh, adopted by uh, ocular oncosarcosis as a program and different program in Africa. And uh, it is important to know that um, 31 countries among uh, all uh, African countries are involved with oncosarcosis. And oncosarca uh, infection is one of the five diseases of the who targeted diseases that has been seen. And obviously, the, uh, this is uh, good with ivermectin. Now, this, this is a patient. Uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, shifting my focus to uh, acanthamoeba or amoeba. This patient uh, who had a uh, history of taking bath in the uh, pool suddenly developed sudden pain in the eye with this lesion, um, plaque like lesion. Uh, there are later on, it developed radial keratoneuritis. Now, if you take a photograph, uh, if you take a biopsy of these cases in keratoplasty, you get a trophozoid and cyst like lesion. Uh, and sometimes if you can do a confocal microscopy also, um, it, it, you can see this one, like this histopathological picture. Now here it is important how to diagnose acanthamoeba. Basically acanthamoeba uh, can be diagnosed with confocal microscopy, very important tool along with, if you do a culture from the uh, corneal uh, um, button, you can do uh, for a non nutrient agar uh, with E. coli overlay along with different stains used for there. Now, uh, treatment for acanthamoebosis is uh, basically the um, uh, uh, debridement, uh, then brolin therapy, neomycin, chlorhexidine, and ultimately keratoplasty may be required. So this is the photograph of acanthamoeba that we have taken uh, in a frozen stain. Now, Sometimes ophthalmomyosis externa, this is a maggot, and uh, the right side picture uh, uh, I shared from Dr. Kasturi Bhattacharji, who has recently operated on one maggot case. Now, this maggot can cause ophthalmomyosis externa, and sometimes the, this can be documented. This is a fluorescent stain, how the, the uh, maggots were uh, documented. 
Now, sometimes ophthalmomyosis uh, external can have a, a ophthalmomyosis internal, and this is what the uh, I have taken from American Academy of Ophthalmology publication. Sometimes they form a crack. That's very very important. The characteristic of that. This is one of our picture with suspected ophthalmomyosis in, internal having a different cracks. Uh, now these cracks uh, are important for diagnosis of the worm. So uh, ophthalmomyosis, uh, the insect mediated uh, ocular disorder, both um, by bot fly maggot uh, and tearing, eyelid twitching, irritation, redness can be there. Pain, photophobia, redness uh, can be present in feature. Subretinal cracks is important and diagnosis is observing CTM examination and fundus examination. Removal of the surface one and argon laser photocoagulation in ophthalmomyosis externa. Sometimes we have uh, can have this type of ectoparasite, which is pithyresis, can have a problem. Now, in this situation, you can put an anesthesia to uh, uh, anesthetize this one and can remove manually. Sometimes even botulinum A in, uh, 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 drops can be given there uh, uh, from the injection syringe and to paralyze this one. This is the pithyresis or ectoparasite that you have seen. Malaria is caused by protozoan, mostly by Plasmodium falciparum, which is a uh, cause of a uh, cerebral malaria. Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, or uh, um, these are the common Plasmodium. Subconjunctival hemorrhage, cotton wool spot, retinal hemorrhage, retinal edema, pan is optic neuritis can happen. Sometimes uh, it can have uh, uh, this can have a uh, then they can be diagnosed. Um, with, uh, on the history of uh, now for malaria control program in India, it is much more uh, advancement in been made uh, to control the disease. So P, plasmodium falciparum, which causes cerebral malaria can have an extensive retinal hemorrhage and more affections. Now, this is very, very important uh, called Ulbechia. Now we see onchocerciasis, I have told you, because this has come in the textbook Ulbechia. Ulbechia means in a diarophyte area, when there is a involvement of microorganism, for example, gram-negative microorganism. Now, if the gram-negative microorganism happens within the uh, what you call um, filaria, then if you put doxycycline in this patient, then they prevent the assisted uh, reproduction and can weaken the organism. So you see in onchocerciasis, there is a ivermectin treatment was first developed. Then there is a regime called ivermectin and doxycycline. And this is because this sort of ulbechia can be seen. This is one of my uh, demonstration of ulbechia in a different filaria one, different filaria one, because uh, in from veterinary parasitology, um, Onchocerca armillata I have document which can have a ulbechia like involvement. Other parasitic diseases like amoebiasis, leishmaniasis, GRDL lemniasis, crimpanosomiasis, ascaresis, and uh, seasonal hyperacute pain is very, very important. Now, amoebiasis, uh, it is important, but various uh, case reports are there for amoebiasis. Sometimes a, a typical CSR has been known for amoebiasis. And also it can have uh, different affection from anterior segment to posterior segment and chorioretinitis, uh, chorioretinal involvement. Leishmaniasis, you see, almost we have a control for leishmaniasis. Uh, there can be a, um, uh, what you call, uh, visceral larva migrants, there may be a mucosal larva migrant or cutaneous larva migrants. And this is something called post collagen dermal leishmaniasis. Now leishmaniasis uh, was a problem earlier and it has a, a series of involvement of the uh, anterior segment to the posterior segment involvement. GRDL lemblia, uh, again, it, it has a GIT involvement. It's a, it can have a other uh, 
um, para GIT involvement and can have a anterior chamber and posterior segment involvement. Trimponosomiasis uh, is uh, uh, again uh, seen along with you know, what you call cystosomiasis. Cystosomiasis is also prevalent, basically a uh, billard geasis, it is called cystosoma hematobium. And cystosoma hematobium is one parasite that has can cause cancer related problem. Ascariasis, you see round one can have anterior chamber as well as posterior chamber involvement. What Mala and Upadhyay uh, uh, had reported from Nepal, very important uh, eviatis, which is endophthalmitis like picture. It is a two year in uh, particular year involvement in the month of autumn from uh, September to December, no, uh, October to December, there's an involvement by yearly of uh, some uh, moth re uh, uh, related uh, eviatis, which can have um, hypopion, it can have pen eviatis. Uh, initially, they got confused. They have done a viral investigation along with um, anti uh, um, uh, bacterial isolation also. Uh, mostly um, till now it is not been diagnosed what exactly causes this. So antibiotic, antiviral and um, personal vitrectomy was useful in some of the cases. Now, this is uh, what uh, from globally, from Indian's perspective of view, toxoplasmosis list in almost all of the um, uh, posterior eviatis, uh, uh, followed by cysticercosis. And Professor, uh, Professor Ratinam et al. had uh, seen trematode infection uh, in their scenario where it is very, very important from uh, uh, public health point of view from South India population. And here uh, from South India, uh, uh, Dr. Biswas, my mentor, has seen a lot of parasitic uveitis from North India, PGA Chandigarh, there's a lot, again, the toxoplasmosis, and later on in the pattern of uveitis, the tuberculosis came ahead of posterior uveitis causes then toxoplasmosis. Now, this is a very useful algorithm by Professor Ratinam, uh, which showed various uh, uh, history from the history, of what I told you in the system exam, which is indirect or, uh, ophthalmoscopy, ultrasound, uh, UVM, uh, ocular uh, OCT. I then know uh, there is a uh, basically serological test, the screening of the uh, uh, parasite. And uh, what we have added is a direct live examination of parasite under microscope. This cuts, uh, slide I've taken courtesy Professor S. Ratina in Journal of Ocular Inflammation and Infection. So in take home message, uh, parasitic diseases are seen in different region of the country and the world. Some parasites are removed live as I showed you. Therefore developing surgical skill is essential. We require methodological approach for diagnosing and treating these ocular parasitic cases. Now, these are the selected references, uh, host of references. And I'd like to acknowledge Professor Harsha Bhattacharji, Sir, Professor Saidul Islam, who is teaching me almost every day about parasitology. Professor uh, Biswas, my mentor, Professor Narsingh Rao, uh, who did a lot of help for scanning electron microscopy and our teaching. Dr. Kasturi Bhattacharji, Dr. Manav, Debdulal Chakraborty Saiten Deka Kalyan Deka Hemrata Apurva and some picture I've taken from Google, particularly from AO series. Thank you for patient hearing. And this is our hospital, uh, which Adi Shankara's statue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dipankar, sir, for the excellent talk and sharing some very uh, great uh, clinical images as well as uh, uh, pathological images. I'm sure the postgraduates would have got a whole new perspective on uh, parasitology. Thank you so much, sir, for your time and effort. Uh, Dr. JB, sir, would you like to comment first before we go to the questions? I was spellbound. I was spellbound. I have not seen such a um, exotic uh, parasites and uh, such exhaustive literature review with uh, such a great experience of parasite disease. He is the parasite man in the country, the ocular parasite man in the country. I don't have any words to express my um, uh, uh, appreciation. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you for your blessings and guidance. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we'll go on to the question, sir. Uh, what is uh, the splendor hoepel phenomenon? Yeah, this is basically a reaction that is seen at the. the this is basically a hypersensitivity reaction that you see in a parasite, basically. An acute hypersensitivity reaction that you see in the parasites. Okay, yeah. and basically IgE mediated disease. Yes. And this, uh, uh, this cascade of even basically a, a skin changes that you see. Now you see these skin changes Sometimes what happen, uh, for example, if you put a, the, some uh, uh, drugs such as dietyl carbamazepine, there's a mesotic reaction, basically seen in oncosarciasis, the immediate reaction. Some of the uh, splendor hippoli or this uh, test are usually uh, help in the diagnosis as a challenging test for the uh, parasitic infection. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is, what is yeah. the pathophysiology of keratitis in a case of ocular uh, onchocerciasis? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Onchocerciasis, actually, you see, this actually what happens, basically, it's a filarial worm. Now, this filarial worm, uh, when it comes to the host, for example, epithelial surface of the host. Oh now, uh, this has a, uh, this has a, the reaction of the host cell. For example, in an epithelial cell, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a, you call biphospholipid layer in a, in a epithelial cell. Now, this happens, this happens, how the, how this epithelial cell uh, reject those adaptive immune response. Now what happened, these cells know they can basically, uh, they can invade directly. Secondly, they can have a, what you called, uh, uh, they have a uh, reaction, which is a direct invasion. Now, this is from the epithelial side, if the keratitis or conjunctivitis or uh, uh, lead infection along with the skin infection happen in uh, uh, now sometimes what happened the microphylaria can come from inside for example from the retinal uh, retinal vessel optic nerve vessel and can deposit it from the posterior aspect of the uh, uh, aspect so in this situation the biphasic involvement may be there. From the epithelial surface may be there, from endothelial surface may be there because of the uh, microphylarial load. One important thing of uh, oncosarciasis is that they are very, very uh, numerous microphylaria is liberated. So if, if you see uh, immunological point of view, both uh, what you call humoral immunity as well as the T cell response happens in those situations. And the, uh, all these pathology and pathophysiology changes happen. Thereafter, there are fibrosis and scarring happen in the cornea. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. JB, sir, would you like to add anything on this? No, I don't have much uh, knowledge about that oncocircle. Okay, okay, sir. So we'll go on to the next question. How to differentiate submacular tinea solium larva from uh, other causes of posterior pole granuloma? Yeah, first of all, I have shown you uh, a picture sometimes of a enucleated specimen with RD. Just uh, below it, there's a subretinal layer. Now, if the uh, retina is translucent, then you can see the live collex moving. That can be also seen in subretinal lesion if your retina is transparent. Okay, now things are granuloma, other granuloma 
can be sarcoid granuloma, there may be TB granuloma, there may be, uh, for example, toxoplasma, it also retinal granuloma, it can happen. Now, toxoplasma, if you see this um, cystic sarcosis, basically, if you want to have, if you do a B scan ultrasound, the scolex and the uh, cyst is visible. That is a diagnostic test. That's the diagnosis. You don't get a cystic changes in a toxoplasma. You do not get a cystic changes, mostly in TB. You do not get a cystic changes in sarcoid, okay? And um, there may be uh, vitreous cells is not taken as an account because vitreous cell may be plus minor in all the differential diagnosis. Okay, so cystic changes, uh, you mean CME? Not cystic, the, the parasitic cyst. cyst. Okay, parasitic okay. Parasitic. Okay. Parasitic cyst. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is how to manage DUSN? DUSN, if you see whether you can see a, a live parasite. Okay, if you find a live parasite, then you have to photocoagulate it. Either with argon laser, you have to photocoagulate it. Okay, now after photocoagulation, there may be other parasite in different sites, then you can put anti helminthic for example, albendazole or steroids. Now, if there may be a situation where you can get a tract and you are this no live one in this situation, or sometimes uh, uh, subretinal changes, the picture I showed in the first case. In those situations, when you do not locate a live one, you probably choose for the uh, anti helminthic and oral steroid. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is again uh, related to this. For how long systemic anti helminthic agents to be continued in case of ocular hydatid cyst? No, ocular hydatid cyst, actually, if you see, this is basically, it involves a orbit and lead, okay? Now, mostly, these are surgically removed. The so, cysts are surgically removed. So, these are surgically removed. Uh, this, or that the hydrated sand or hydrated cysts are there, they are surgically removed, okay? And uh, role of uh, other uh, anti-helminthic or anti echinococcal I am not sure about it, but I think the treatment primarily on surgical removal. Yes, sir. So, so the last question for the day is, in a patient with posterior subcapsular cataract post-ocular toxocariasis, what is the correct time for cataract surgery? First of all, if it's a toxocariasis, we have to understand that whether there's an active toxocariasis or inactive toxocariasis, first of all. Second thing is that whether toxocariasis has additional complication, okay? That's important. But posterior subcapsular cataract, it should follow all the guidelines of inflammation that we practice, okay? That three months silent, we have three to six months, minimum three months silent, then we operate it, okay? Grade of cataract, okay? Additional complication after toxocariasis, if it required a uh, 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 retinal detachment surgery for a complication, whether you club both the thing, vitrectomy as well as cataract surgery together, that plan you have to do. But controlling the inflammation is most important, at least three months. Yes, sir. So thank you so much. Uh, it was really a very interesting uh, session today, sir. And uh, you showed some really great cases. We don't see all these cases routinely. And there was so much to learn. I think I'll also see your talk on repeat again because there was so much to absorb from it. Thank you so much for your time and effort. And thank, thank you, you, Dr. Please. Jamie, sir, for joining. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to you also, ma'am, for being there with us and for all the discussions that you make more make them more interesting. Thank you so much, ma'am. So uh, the next session will be on February twenty second.
that will be on non-neoplastic uveitis masquerade syndromes by Dr. Alok Sen. So uh, looking forward to seeing all of you and thank you again, Dipankar Das, sir, for the wonderful lecture and the amazing documentation. Amazing. Thank Most you, important. Yes, thank you, to learn today. Thank you, Abhilesha. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.